Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming. We heard parking was a little challenging. Sorry for the little bit of a late start here. We wanted to make sure everybody could get settled. My name is Charlotte Kasich. I am the director here at the Barry Art Museum and really happy to have you all here today. Um, so we're here to celebrate Leo Tchaikovsky. He is our inaugural new visiting artist in a series that we have recently founded. Um, this was quite the partnership. We have the Barry Museum of Art, the Chrysler Museum Glass Studio. We have the VMFA, Arts at ODU, and CHKD. Um, we all are jointly hosting sculptor Leo Tchaikovsky as our inaugural featured artist for our new visiting artist program. So what is that, you might ask? The primary thing is that we are inviting um, contemporary makers to meet with our student body here at ODU, uh, to mentor them, to give them feedback on their artwork, and then to have a public glassblowing demonstration at the Chrysler Glass Studio, which happened today at noon. Sorry if you missed it. Um, and then do this lecture here at the Barry Art Museum at the night. So that is the nature of this new series. And I'm sure that uh, Leo's going to give me very honest feedback on this whole thing afterwards. <laughs> Um, so a little bit more about Leo. Leo was born in New Mexico, raised in Miami, and he currently lives in Brooklyn, um, although he also spent a lot of time in Philly. Leo operates at the junction of many varying cultural experiences. His work combines these lived experiences with craft traditions and popular imagery and ideology from hip hop, graffiti, and diverse religious knowledge. Tchaikovsky's work begins as blown shapes with soft forms that are then worked into deconstructed icons with hard edges, sharp points, and precise lines. The surfaces are finished with decisive geometric cuts and freehand painted to graffiti. His works are often freehand sculptures, hung neon, even mounted on welded steel frames. Tchaikovsky has compared his glass practice and process to that of street art. It's not in that it's hot, fast, or rough. Get in, get there, and then get home. <laughs> And that's kind of like this residency. His most industrial work to date is the new 2021 Rakow Commission for the Corning Museum of Glass. And um, it consists of eight common uh, motifs and graffiti surrounded by the letter B, which is what you're seeing up here today. Um, for him, this primarily represents birth, being, and breath. These glass icons are wall mounted and held aloft by a spiraling structure of painted steel. Uh, Tchaikovsky holds a BA in fine art from Alfred University, also my alma mater, where we met when we were 18. We're not going to do math right now. <laughs> and he has an MA in fine art from the School of Visual Arts um, in New York. He's taught at such institutions as the Corning Museum of Glass, Penland School of Crafts, and currently teaches at the Tyler School of Art in Philly. Um, notably, his residencies include the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Pittsburgh Glass Center, Stockholm Glass in Sweden, and Urban Glass Studio in Brooklyn. He's in the CHKD collection. He's in our collection here, which you can see in gallery too after his talk. He's in the Chrysler Museum collection. And it's with great pleasure that I give you Leo Tokoski. Thank you, Charlotte. <clears throat> Check. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome. Graffiti is the language of the people. Making marks on the walls is as old as humanity. It's sort of a primeval way of communication. Um, but graffiti as we know it, contemporary graffiti was invented in America. It's an American craft in the Bronx, in Philadelphia, in New Jersey, <clears throat> purveyed by the youth as a rebuttal against corporate and commercial invasion. Glass is also a craft. <clears throat> and when it comes to neon, the signage that the neon sign conveys is very similar to graffiti. The lines flow. They call your attention to a specific area. And they are stylized. When I learned about neon, it made them very, uh, it made it was, made a lot of sense to translate that into the neon 
uh, and I was learning how to uh, work glass at this time as well. This is from my undergraduate experience. Um, so I went from spray painting, using spray paint and walls to using glass tubes and flames to create my handle. There's lots of iconography employed in graffiti. It's not just a name or a word. There's arrows, stars, crowns, exclamation points. Uh, all of these are stylized by the writer or the individual artist. And as I learned more and more about glass processes, I, I found that translating those icons into the techniques of glass making was a very satisfying uh, experience for me. And I realized that using glass was a way to transform graffiti and graffiti art. Glass is reflective, among other things. And so by using a little bit of light, some mirror and a stencil, I was able to translate a flattened image into a reflective image, occupying two walls at the same time. The more I work with neon, the, the more sculptural, I was able to start to render it and think about some of the elements of the medium that you don't see, such as the wires and the mounts. And here I am using a pedestal in a different way by mounting a neon tube right on top of it and employing a glass mirror with a stencil on it. It's sort of an early uh, comp compilation of glass materials that I was investigating. It's interesting because graffiti is this sort of uh, outsider folk art, depending on who you talk to. Um, it's also vandalism. Um, it's also memorials. Um, glass is also like the you know, forsaken stepchild of the art world, looked down upon for its craftsness. So I latched onto that. Um, I'm, I'm really into subversion. And so experimenting again with materials using spray adhesive as a resist for sandblast, I was able to create a negative sandblasted image here. It's hard to explain that, but um, it's also hard to explain the revelation of what that was when I was creating it. <clears throat> so I had to put an exclamation point on it. So graffiti is like the visual component of hip hop. I'm a hip hopper, I'm a b-boy. I have partaked uh, in breakdancing, graffiti, DJing, and MCing. <clears throat> but when I started working with glass, all that went out the window. But I wanted to retain the decorative and um, emotional elements of hip hop. So as my bending got better and my compositions got better, I started incorporating more of the decorative elements of graffiti into those compositions, using mirrors to mimic the highlights that you find in bubble letter forms while using the neon to create the outlines. This piece is entitled Manifest Density as a take on the term Manifest Destiny. At some point I started blowing glass, which is one of the hardest things anybody can do. Um, head spins are harder, but glass blowing is up there. 
but it's that same kind of idea that sort of like using gravity, using temperature, using time, as well as uh, traditional techniques. Here, employing the Grawl technique, which is a Swedish technique of getting imagery into the glass from the 1920s. And I was intrigued by the process of creating that type of technique, which is effectively flipping a bubble inside out on top of another glass bubble. <clears throat> and at the same time, encasing the tag inside of the glass. So paying homage to the tradition while also subverting it with the graffiti inside of it. Similar process, except this is using enamels, a little bit more literal and sort of self-portraiture, um, but layering the glass with graphic imagery. Again, in a long line, in a long tradition of glass methodology, but taking it, employing the hip hop methodology, looking at it through that lens and sort of reclaiming it in a way in the way that graffiti reclaims space and identity. Not until you've heard Rakim on a rocky mountaintop have you heard hip hop extract the urban element that created it and let an open wide countryside illustrate it. <clears throat> I didn't understand what Saul Williams meant until I went to Alfred University, which is in the middle of practically nowhere, two mountains and one stop late. But I found that being in that kind of environment catapults the kind of expression. You would think being in the woods has nothing to do with hip hop, but the clarity that comes from that space brought me closer to it. Something similar happened uh, at Pilchuck Glass School many moons ago. Um, anecdotally, one summer I went there. Pilchuck Glass School is a is a workshop, glass workshop started by Dale Chihuly precisely 50 years ago, this year or last year. This year? Last year. I landed as a teaching assistant, and <clears throat> this is literally in the mountains on a tree farm outside of Seattle, overlooking the Puget Sound. And it's a pristine landscape with timbered roofs and hills and grass, and it's very pastoral. And there's no nothing urban in sight. However, this year we were implicitly instructed not to put any graffiti upon campus. Very strange. Not sure why that session that was specific. So in rebuttal to that, to the administration, the uh, participating faculty got together. We made a gigantic illuminated totem out of glass. And I proceeded to spray paint it live in the middle of the night. <clears throat> uh, And that was a way for us to reclaim the space of Pilchuck. We had been invited there to share our knowledge with the community, but only at the at the instruction of the administration. And we decided that that wasn't good enough for us. <clears throat> Everything just look a little better with a little graffiti on it. That's it, a little bit. I guess I really like this piece. <laughs> Uh, the chairs for scale. I mean, the thing's nine feet tall and a feet in of itself that much, you know, it's, it's two pieces of six foot tall pieces, or sorry, four foot tall pieces of glass uh, stacked on top of each other. Um, <clears throat> so from the mountaintop to one of the oldest urban centers of the world, continuous urban centers of the world, Istanbul, 
in Turkey. And um, through glass making, I built a network and became involved in education after I graduated and started working with Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston. And we were doing study abroad courses in Istanbul through the lens of glass art, traveling with students. And I did that every other year from 2008 till 2014. And I was blown away by Islamic art and architecture, specifically Ottoman, mid, uh, you know, Renaissance era, Ottoman architecture and art and calligraphy um, and drawing huge parallels between my own work, hip hop, graffiti art, stylization, form. The Ottomans believe that uh, your experience in life, where you live, how you live, your house, your parks, your palaces should all have this sort of decorative feeling that uh, that you could um, sort of lavish decoration that you that you that you could live in. Um, and so everything is just heavily ornamented. And the craftspeople that uh, engaged or sorry, produced those crafts, spent a lifetime learning these crafts, masons, calligraphy writers, these are traditions that uh, people start when they're 13 years old and do until they can't do it anymore. And through collaboration with some Turkish artists at the Mimar Sinan University, we did a series of screen printed enameled glass panels. So you can screen print glass, fire it onto the surface making them permanent. And with the transparency of glass, you can, tr you can layer those images. So this is photographic imagery provided by the group of collaborators to sort of express our cross-cultural experience. <clears throat> and I really, I really thrived on that meeting of the minds and I've, built it into my practice. And when I came back to my own studio, I started working in that same vein, slightly larger scale. This is actually to scale roughly. Um, and employing the photographic imagery, adding in the stencil or the, uh, the hand styles and calligraphy styles, but taking them out of the square and moving them way closer to the um, stylized typography that graffiti is known for. When I talk about hip hop, I'm not talking about um, lowercase H-I-P-H-O-P. -H I'm talking about capital H-I-P-H-O-P, -H the culture. And not all hip hop musicians are talking about the same thing. And the music that most influenced me were artists like Eric B and Rakim, Wu-Tang Clan, KRS-One, Erica Badu. In their lyrics, they were speaking about things that esoteric uh, systems that I were sort of foreign to me. So I was, Initially, just bringing sort of the, the visual elements of those groups into my glass making processes. Just working sculpturally, um, kind of an ode to the Wu-Tang Clan. If you don't know, that's the, the Wu W. Put them up if you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. But what those individual artists were talking about was something called the supreme understanding, which is based upon two themes, the supreme mathematics and the supreme alphabet. Attributing 
uh, characteristics to individual numbers and letters to find a deeper meaning within those numbers and letters and using them to find deeper meaning within myself and my work, but also to use them formally. So translating some of those canons into the graffiti form, stylizing them. This is known as the 12 jewels, what every person deserves and requires to live. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, freedom, justice, equality, food, clothing, shelter, love, peace, and happiness. But even older than the Ottoman art was the um, Moorish art in Spain that I found after traveling there. So my, my experiences in Turkey made me wanna seek out more of this history that you know, we're not really taught about in our educations. And if we are, it's shrouded in marginalization. So what we're looking at here is an intricate plaster work of calligraphy, um, scripture from the Quran with floral and botanical motifs. But if you look closely at the veins on the floral uh, motif, those smaller individual vein lines are actually letters. Okay, so sort of letters on letters on letters. <clears throat> So I take that back into the studio again and start making. Um, you can see I'm starting to incorporate that into the calligraphy there. There's wisdom there, the number two in the corner. Um, I'm starting to make these compositions that are a little bit uh, esoteric, but at the same time, slightly recognizable. Um, and in 2016, I had a solo show first solo show at the Glass Wheel Studio here in Norfolk, Virginia. And um, I started making work that I hadn't made before, working sculpturally, going off round, becoming off, you know, off, off symmetrical. And somebody today asked me in the demo, you know, what, what draws you to glass as a medium? And I mean, that, that right there, you know, that plasticity of that material is what draws me to it, along with its transparency and its ability to go from honey to solid in 35 seconds. But glass is usually around. I mean, walk around here, you'll see. It's usually round. <clears throat> but again, I, got, I wanna subvert that. I'm gonna push back on tradition a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not forcing the glass, but I'm, I'm asking it to work with me uh, begrudgingly, I'll say. And it's different than working in metal, casting metal, say. Um, you can't get as close to molten iron as you can to molten glass. So this is where I work. So I work in a hot shop. I work in a furnace. There you go. Meanwhile, while I'm trying to figure out this very hard square, non-round process, 
I'm also trying to work out letter forms and surface texture. And I go back in the studio, I start working again, a little more traditionally, working in clay, working in wax, creating molds, blowing glass into molds to get these static forms. And this was a way for me to sort of compound imagery, compound form, um, without such a large learning curve in the glass shop. Um, you could see in the past video that there's a lot going on there. There's no setting the piece down, having lunch, coming back. You don't go home and take a nap and think on it and come back to the studio. You work the glass from start to finish. So working in this methodology, I had a little bit more control over form and texture by working in the clay and making a mold. And so I'm able to start to work through visualizing some of the letter forms here. We're talking about a stylized C with some geometric patterns and some Kufic script relief on the top. This is uh, the 18th letter. On the other side of this is the, the shape of the letter R, uh, which is the 18th letter. And it's a it's a a piece I made for the artist Rakim, you know, from me to him in my studio. And I I go back to the neon, um, working with the handle, the tag, that stylized uh, typography, very very reminiscent of calligraphy, and the turas, the signatures of the Ottoman sultans that were highly stylized for official documents. Um, same here, the letter E, you know, working through the wild style, the bubble letters, trying to translate those into the different glass making techniques that I'm learning along the way. And I'm constantly interested in learning. My entire practice is knowledge-based. Everything I learn goes into my practice and my practice requires learning for it to function. And so this is the first piece I made with the arrow icons and it's a hanging chandelier form, sort of a rebuttal to the uh, Moranese chandelier. I also work outside of glass a little bit as a sort of sketch mode. Glass making is uh, cost prohibitive. It requires energy, it requires a lot of space. So sometimes you need to get some ideas down and found objects are the best way to go, stencils, spray paint. This piece is titled is entitled arm slash leg, leg, arm, head, an acronym for Allah. And that is not to reference the term as a um, an ode to the Islamic the name of the Islamic God, that acronym arm, leg, leg, arm, head is a reclamation of that word, internalizing that power and that ownership. This is layered spray paint with stencil, working through color, working through form, texture. Same. This was done on residence at the Bukhara artist residence in Germany. So from here to pure spray paint to sheet glass stenciled on top of a spray painted panel to all glass stenciled and written on. Here it is on a kiln shelf being fused on a kiln, I'm sorry, in a kiln. The, the high heat fuses layers of glass together. It also fuses the screen printed imagery to the surface of the glass, making it glossy, but also archivally permanent. And I go from flat
to round and that will get seamed together, turned into a bubble and then sculpted. Cell phones are amazing. I'm serious, on the spot documentation, especially for glass makers, crucial. So Jeff Sarmiento either invented the term or came about the term of the um, graphic swim, taking an image, Lay, putting it on the glass, letting the qualities of glass be dictated by heat and gravity to alter that imagery. So you can see on that yellow piece, the black forms, those are the circles on that first panel, which have now been twisted, bent, and sort of pulled. That's glass, can only do that in glass. Through my life, I spent some time in Sweden and made many contacts there and connections. Among them, uh, Simon Clinell, who is a, a glass artist, the son of two Swedish studio glass artists. And we've grown up together in this glass business. And in 2017, we had an opportunity to collaborate together in Brooklyn. So he came out. And we literally just mashed up our glass together. He made his work, which are the squares, or sorry, the cylindrical forms on the bottom. I made some arrow forms and we jammed them together. But it was so, it was so um, sort of freeing to be able to think about glass making like that, that we could just smash some glass together. It has that quality to be able to do that. So why not? partake in that it doesn't always have to have the lip nice and thin folded out the cuts don't have to be perfectly in place we can get molten we can get blobby um, and I think that collaboration really opened up my eyes a lot I learned how to cut glass from him and so we created a show we created a we created a show in a week we we made a bunch of glass and we had a studio show of these forms. Doing things like blowing cylinders, cutting them open and making them back into flat glass. And I think that this was a learning process, another knowledge form about the material, pushing it to the extreme, going over the edge, coming back, and then repeating that process in a cyclical way to come to these forms that are sort of not really anything, but also many things at once. And it was so successful. We did it again in Sweden the next year. Um, this time we had a little more support. I went. And I was in residence at Stockholm Glass for six weeks, and we created work to fill this gallery, um, which was a was previously a porcelain factory, an 18th century porcelain factory in Western Stockholm, Eastern Stockholm. So it was interesting working sort of in the parameters of this older uh, material factory setting. So this work was another chandelier work I created um, called Fabrik Styles, which means factory styles in Swedish. And it's that's a layered title. I mean, it was made in a factory, but because of our timing, we sort of had to work in a quick way. We needed to get work out. So we worked in a more of a factory style, which was worrying less about some of the finishing aspects and getting some of the forms out as soon as we could. I added a projector to amplify those qualities of glass, those, those reflective, refractive, and deflective qualities of glass. 
So we had shadows on the wall, but you can also see the color of the glass diffracting on the wall as well. So I'm thinking about layers in graffiti art, layers of paint and how the surface of graffiti always looks so rich and so deep to me. And how can I use glass and the space around it to uh, convey the same feeling? So this is some of Simon's work. And this, these two shows are called semiotics, which means the study of symbols. And we, we tied it together in a zoetrope. A zoetrope is the first motion picture um, assembly. It's effectively a cylindrical tube with slits cut in it and pictures, sequential pictures of motion in it. And when spun, looking through those slits, you can see the motion occurring on the, uh, on the inside of the tube, a motion picture, a movie. So we took that to the next level using glass and um, high-speed strobe light. And a, and a high speed turntable with glass on it. So hard to sort of hard to see because the frame per second situation is, but when you're in person, it's a blur of glass in front of you. But if you blink fast in front of it, you can see each individual form present itself in front of you, bottle shape, cone shape, et cetera. Um, Simon's a little bit more conceptually oriented than I am. So he was sort of diving deeper into the semiotics idea and I was willing to go along with him formally. Back out in the world, right? So out in the world, back to the studio, go back out into the world, come back into the studio. And this is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. It's the oldest, um, mosque structure known or still standing. It's from 690 AD, it's 1300 years old. And it's beautiful. The tile work on it is immaculate and the, the dome is golden. <clears throat> and around the corner is some graffiti in Hebrew. And I had never seen graffiti in another script before, which was intriguing to me, at least not in person, probably in books, but not in person. And sort of to see this like stylized affectation on Hebrew letters was very interesting. And to see that cross-cultural connection happening, right? Different language, different text even, but I know what that is. That's graffiti. That's somebody trying to say something. This is um, Eritrean, an entirely different type of script as well. And this is not graffiti, this is, a, this is a barbershop, but it's signage and it's stylized, right? You can see there's a black shade on there. Somebody went to some pains to make sure that this wasn't just you know some scratches on the wall. So back in the studio formalizing and synthesizing all those experiences. And in, and, and in those places, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in Istanbul, in Cordoba, um, in Morocco, there is what's known as the Medina, which is the ancient marketplace. And they're um, usually medieval centers with very narrow streets, but filled with the souks, which are the, which are the stalls, selling clothing, food silver, wares, everything. Um, and it's, it's, this, it's this very intimate setting, lights and sights and sounds and smells. Um, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to mimic that in this installation called uh, Neon, Med this is the Neon Medina that I made in Brooklyn. And in hip hop, Brooklyn is Medina. <clears throat> 
So as I'm moving through the world, as I'm moving through things, as I'm learning things, they're all coming back on themselves. It's like I've already known these things. <clears throat> And I wanted to create a space in this very small sort of alleyway that mimicked that feeling. And now I'm starting to put stencils on the wall. I'm starting to incorporate a little bit more literal geometry, um, a little bit more literal graffiti. But also you can see on the glass pieces, there's this white writing. That's, that's more of the enamel work that I'm starting to experiment with. I'm using paint markers to tag the surface of the glass. I'm firing it into the surface of the glass, non-traditional enamels. That's, that's, that's on there, that's permanent. That's not coming off. I mean, glass is sort of alive. Even when it's cold, it's still alive. And that what you were seeing with that sign there was the, the Krypton gas in there getting excited by the, by the electricity running through it. I think we're nine months pregnant there. That's why I look like that. Not long after that, had the esteemed honor of participating in the two-person show called Graffiti and Ornament with Roberto Lugo, who is the, um, the ghetto potter from Philly, North Philly. And I was able again to take over another historical space, this time at the Hamilton Mansion in West Philadelphia, a Federalist house built in the 1700s. And <clears throat> I came in and created a a chandelier here to do some space reclamation. And in planning for the show, which took the course of a year or so, my grandmother passed away, who was a Philadelphia native, historical buff, and all around Philly gal. And this piece was, <clears throat> came about sort of in dedication to her. And I realized that her depression era glass collection that she had in her house was why I am a glass maker. Those pale colors, those sort of uh, imprinted textures um, really stuck with me. And that's kind of the aesthetic I pull when I'm thinking about the glass qualities. It's sort of, it's inherent qualities, I guess I should say. And so this one is illuminated by, illuminated by sunlight and moonlight. Her name was Evelyn, we called her Ev. So I did a couple uh, Philly style graffiti tags in her name. <clears throat> Every city has its own style. I'm sure you notice that. Philly style is very stark. It's very harsh, but I appreciate that. Uh, there's cut arrow next to Roberto Lugo's uh, self-portraiture plate. And then Lugo heard I did something for my grandmother, so he did something for his. But this was an interesting show. I mean, if you don't know Lugo's work, he is a potter, but the imagery that he puts on his, on his work is out of this world. It's a combination of traditional techniques and graffiti styles and motifs. This is some work I made while in residence at the Toledo Museum of Art. And I really wanted to get into experimentation with the enamel processes. Up to this point, I've been sort of winging it. And I spent the time making glass, writing on it, firing it, and, and seeing what the results were all about.
you start working with colors a little bit differently. So after I start wrapping my round around the process, the technique, the style, like, you know, <clears throat> people say, how long does it take you to make that piece? I mean, on the shop floor, it took me an hour and a half. It took me 20 years to get to that point. So not every piece is going to have, you know, the essence of everything that I know up to that point. But now as I'm starting to get my technique straight, I can start thinking about some of the inherent qualities of glass, like color and how color reacts with itself and the clear glass. And able to start doing tones in the way that graffiti art is so well at it, you know, working with. There is, of course, clear glass, which is the essence. Um, and now branching out into letter forms. This is the triple A, A, Alif, Alif, Alpha. Some of the work is a little bit more sculptural and referencing some of the um, motifs in graffiti, like serifs and connectors and um, points. So they don't, they're not quite as recognizable. But I'm starting to add in steel armature as a way to incorporate the glass into the wall. Again, from the from the Toledo Museum, this piece is over at the Chrysler. This piece is entitled Knowledge. It's also the number one in mathematics. One is knowledge. I made this in residence at Urban Glass last year. Um, and this is just kind of a formal study in color letters and shapes. Taking those recognizable forms, stars, arrows. This is the letter B. This is this is B-boy. This is B-boy, parentheses, still life. This is down the street at the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters uh, Children's Psychiatric Hospital. Commission I worked on last year and installed entitled Jewels. So as I told you before, the 12 Jewels were all entitled to, this builds off of that and adds in things like love and life and health and healing um, and made for the children. Because as we know, Wu-Tang is for the children. And this is the piece de resistance, my most ambitious work to date, as they say. Um, the Rakow Commission, which is a, a yearly commission awarded by the Corning Museum of Glass to artists working um, at the forefront of the material. Um, and so this was made in 2021. It's the 36th Rakow Commission. So this is entitled the 36th Chamber, which references Wu-Tang Clan, this album, but also Wu-Tang Clan, the movie. If you don't know what the 36th Chamber is, you should check it out. In Kung Fu, there were 35 chambers and there was a, there was a disciple who completed all 35 chambers and wanted to share that knowledge with the people so they could defend themselves against the colonialists. But the monks would not allow him. They cast him out of the monastery. So he started his own school and that became the 36th chamber. <clears throat> so this is the 36th. And it's the letter B, which symbolizes breath. It also symbolizes to be born. It also symbolizes um, being and B is the number is the second letter. It's the it's the um, first hard sounding letter. It's sort of the most bombastic letter of the alphabet. So it made sense for me to sort of work through this, especially in twenty twenty one, 
you know, we're all sort of breathing really lightly at that point. Um, <clears throat> and this piece ties everything that I know to date together. Actual graffiti on the wall, stylized stencil of Islamic art and architecture, graphic metalwork and graphic glass with enamel graffiti on the surface of it. Okay, and that's it. Wow, that was perfect. All right, I'm not supposed to do this, but this is definitely your best artwork ever, <laughs> except for the one that you made with Simon that we have here. This thing is incredible. The way that like the metal has become part of the line and the layering and the graffiti, I feel like it it is your piece to resistance. We got a lot of white walls in here, Leo. Hey, I'm just saying. Um, so this is the moment. If anybody has a few questions, we have a couple minutes. So if anybody wants to pop up a hand and raise a few, we. I mean, I see your daughter has been raising her hand the whole time. Credit, did you have a question? You're good. What is it? Your daddy's smart, isn't he? Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of people in the crowd that have seen him work in the hot shop. Do you guys have any questions regarding technique or ideas? Yes, Sarah in the back. So for those that were recording, the question was, what's next? That was me paraphrasing my dear friend Sarah's words. <laughs> what's next after this one? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it, yeah, that's a good question. It's this interesting because the Raquel Commission came about um, generally with the way that thing works is the 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 curator of the gallery decides or nominates an artist and it's decided upon they go to that artist studio and they decide what's going to go in in my case um we came up with a brand new commission for the rack out which was not in the studio so that's what's next what's next is what's what i haven't done um what I'm doing now is I'm still working on forms and skills to stay in that methodology to hopefully have some formal and technical breakthroughs. Um, <clears throat> but I am waiting for that opportunity to expand it. Um, I have a very small studio space, et cetera, et cetera. Like all the things that artists deal with um, that I can't just be like making monumental sculptures to have curators come check out you know every six months so my studio has like a smattering of objects that represent what i'm interested in what i'm doing um i have been working a lot with this the spray paint nozzle the little tiny tip and trying to work with that as a form um in graffiti, the spray tip also becomes an icon. It becomes personalized. You know, you put eyes on it, a mouth on it. It becomes this, it becomes um, a being. I'm sort of taking it in a different way. I don't want to make it into a caricature. I want to break it down to its elemental forms and find, you know, the proportions of the angles of the different cylindrical forms on it, the ribs on it. Um, so I am working with those sort of as like formal studies. Um, but I don't know what's next. Pardon me, um, asking, 
if I had more time for that specific piece. Yeah, I wish I had more time, but um, I actually, I take that back. Fabrique Styles was made based on a set of um, parameters, time being one of them. And I'm okay working under those parameters. And I relish that actually. Um, graffiti, you've got to get it up and get out. Even break dancing, even DJing, the party ends, you know, when you're break dancing, like everything is ephemeral in that instance. So you sort of have to slam it out in that moment um, and not hold anything back for the next one because there could not be another one for whatever reason that may be. So the parameters of time are not as important to me. I, I, I would be remiss if somebody came to me and said, oh, here's this amount of time. Can you do something? If I said no, that would be irresponsible. Um, but what I can do is say, I can do this in this amount of time and I can operate under these parameters under that amount of time. So I don't wish that I had more time. Um, I wish there were more times that I could come up against that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I would say that I uh, purposefully operate outside of that. Um, so the question was, being a Brooklyn artist, how do I find creating? Mm. Brooklyn to me is more about um, an epicenter of thought. New York is the birthplace of hip hop. Like it just sort of, you know, when you're 20, you're like, all right, let's do it. Let me go there and get some of that. Let me get that, pack it in. Um, I don't really consider myself a Brooklyn artist. Um, I'm a student of the world and I'm based in Brooklyn. And I'll take over any space that they'll let me. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> oh, wait, there's one last. Okay. Uh, now I write Tico, which is, you know, my name, Tikoski, Tico, T E C O. Thank you. Short one. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But it is proprietary. <laughs> Okay, so there's one last student that asked, is there anything that you do to get into the creative pursuit? Like, is there, mm -hmm. is there something that you do to, like, prepare yourself emotionally and creatively to get into the um, I never left it. I'm in it. I'm here. Um, and that's the only way to do it. Otherwise, it's too scary and too hard. So you got, you got to be in it. You got to live it. I mean, yeah. I don't, there's not, a, there's no compartmentalizing here of my glass life, my family life, my work life. It's all, it's all the same thing. It's all, it's all my, like being chained to the furnace, basically. That's it. That's all. That's all there is. Um, okay, we'll talk about that.
Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So a couple last little announcements. Um, housekeeping, if you will. I don't know. Today's February 2nd. So I guess it's Black History Month. <laughs> and we have a lot of robust programming. So there's some handouts over by that food that I hope you guys eat. Um, grab some, come back. The next one that's coming up is um, next Friday, the 10th from 5 to 8 p.m. We have the um, Resist Unite. We have coffee and conversations on the 16th. And then we have a perspectives exhibit, which is um, glass from the Waitzer collection. Uh, so if you want to see all of the artists that Leo is working up against and sort of in their history and lineage, that exhibition opens on March 10th. We hope you'll come back and join us. And thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Have a great evening.